Yes, good morning and thank you for the uh, invitation to speak to your conference today. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be involved. Um, my name is Blair Turner. Uh, I'm from the Australian Road Research Board. Uh, we're based in Melbourne, Australia, and I'm the National Technical Leader for our uh, Safe Road Infrastructure team. Uh, I've been working in the area of speed management for around uh, 20 years, uh, and it's actually also the subject of my, my PhD. Uh, it is a pleasure to be talking to you from Australia today. Um, I think uh, Canada and Australia share uh, a lot of similar issues, um, particularly being quite large countries where our resources need to be spread quite thinly. We don't have big budgets to spend uh, on our roads, particularly in our more remote areas. Uh, and it's in this environment that the speed management issues become uh, a lot more important, uh, particularly on our, our rural roads where we can't afford to put in place uh, high quality infrastructure everywhere. Uh, so issues like speed management um, play a, a larger role. So uh, I'd love to be with you there today uh, and I'd welcome certainly the opportunity to, to visit uh, and talk to you directly. Uh, but my contact email address is on the slide here and I'll show that again at, at the end. I want to cover uh, some uh, major issues in the discussion and this important topic of, of speed uh, and speed management. Uh, and firstly, and you may have already heard about this, uh, just to touch base on the speed problem uh, as it uh, affects road safety. Uh, I'll then talk uh, mainly about the safe system approach uh, that we use here in Australia to, uh, as a guiding principle for, for road safety and how this links to what we're doing in the speed management area. Uh, and then I'll show you some of the, uh, the solutions that we're, we're using. Some of these will be familiar, perhaps some will be, be new. Uh, I hope it's uh, of interest. And similarly, the, the tools we use, in particularly in managing uh, speed limits. Uh, and then at the end, I've just got a couple of reference documents and details on where you can go for, for this information. So firstly, in terms of the speed problem, uh, it certainly is a global issue. It's a problem in, in every country, uh, and there is a global evidence base um, surrounding uh, this issue, uh, and very, very clear and firm evidence around the contribution of speed to, to crash risk. Uh, and uh, in most countries we've looked at, it is uh, an issue in, in around about a third of fatal and serious crashes. Speed is some sort of a contributor, whether it's traveling too fast for the conditions or traveling uh, above the speed limit. Uh, and there's a very, very strong link between uh, the changes in speeds and, and crash outcomes. Uh, and so for any given road, uh, if, we change, if speeds are increasing and nothing else uh, changes in terms of the, the infrastructure, uh, we do tend to see an increase in risk. Uh, and then uh, on the other side of that, if there's a reduction in speeds, then we tend to see an improvement in safety. And the graphic to the right here uh, shows it's not just in terms of uh, the reductions, but it's also in terms of the severity of, of those. Uh, and the, the, the line, the red line there shows the sensitivity around uh, fatal uh, uh, crash outcomes, and it's a far more sensitive measure. From a quite small change in speeds, we get quite large changes in the more severe crash outcomes. So in this uh, graphic, and it's a little bit dated now, but it's still roughly uh, in, in, in order of uh, what we see in more recent research, with a 2% increase in, uh, in speeds, we see around a 10% change in, in, in deaths on the roads. Uh, and conversely, if the, the speed's reduced by that amount, we see similar reductions in, in deaths. Uh, and so the key point here being that um, certainly the more severe crash outcomes um, are most affected by speed. The safe system approach, and I know there's been discussions in Canada around this, uh, it is the global approach for addressing road safety. Uh, we've had it and been applying it for the last 10 years now in Australia. Um, I won't go into details, I'm short on time uh, to, to allow that, uh, but just in basic terms, the approach has grown, as I'm sure most of you will know, from the Swedish Vision Zero approach, uh, but also the Dutch Sustainable Safety approach. And uh, there was a manual produced in 2008 by the OECD uh, that's available on the internet, which really lays out the basic thinking around this approach. Uh, and just as an aside, that document's been uh, updated at the moment, uh, and later this year we should, should see a revised uh, advice around the safe system approach. Some of the key uh, elements of the safe system, uh, firstly, and this comes from the Vision Zero uh, element, that uh, death and serious injury aren't just a natural byproduct from transport, uh, and in fact, it's not acceptable. We should be moving to a situation where um, death and serious injury is, is not seen as a norm in terms of uh, our roads, uh, and certainly be working towards the long-term goal uh, to eliminate death and serious injury. Now, that's certainly a long-term goal. It's not gonna happen in the next uh, one to two years, uh, but it's where we're aiming towards. 
The second key point is it revolves around the key pillars in road safety, and you're probably used to, to this terminology in terms of uh, the different approaches we take. Uh, safer speeds, safer road users, safer vehicles is, is commonly discussed. Uh, but the pillars also include uh, the focus of today's discussions, uh, safer speeds, uh, and particularly at the global level, the global action plan also refers to safe, uh, effective post-crash care as one of the key pillars as well. And it's only when all of these pillars work together that we'll achieve this elimination of death and serious injury. We can certainly make progress with any of these uh, pillars in isolation, but they only really work most effectively when, when they're combining across pillars. Another factor is the issue of shared responsibility. Uh, and it's been, uh, I guess, the historic approach that we've blamed the, the road user uh, when a crash occurs. And, uh, and we do recognize that the vast majority of crashes are actually caused by some form of human error. Uh, so if you think of a crash like uh, a fatigue and a vehicle uh, a fatigue driver uh, driving off the side of a, a rural road um, and striking a tree, that's definitely a, a behavioral uh, cause to that crash. But there is also other responses for us uh, as road managers to effectively manage uh, the, the outcomes of these crashes. And so in that scenario with that fatigued driver, we could put in place uh, roadside protection. So if the driver does leave the road, uh, then uh, they'll strike perhaps a barrier and maybe just have a minor injury or, or perhaps just continue on their journey. And so this understanding leads to this uh, concept around shared responsibility. Uh, we can't just blame drivers for, uh, for mistakes. Uh, all of the different players in road safety across all these different pillars have a, a role to play. And the last element uh, is the human tolerances issue, and we do have a really good understanding now around the uh, survivable impact speeds uh, for different types of, of crashes. Uh, and this graphic uh, might be familiar to many of you, it's been used uh, a lot previously. Uh, what it shows here, the red line I'll, I'll perhaps uh, step through, uh, this is the uh, survivable speeds of a vehicle striking a pedestrian. Uh, and um, this isn't uh, hard and fast, These, uh, the evidence base uh, is evolving on this issue, but I think this gives us some fairly uh, basic rules uh, to be working towards. Uh, and so in this case, at the bottom of this uh, graphic, uh, you'll see that uh, the chance of death and serious injury at lower speeds uh, is zero. If you, there's no speeds, there's no chance of a, of a death if you strike a pedestrian. But as we get faster and faster, and up to this critical point around 30 kilometers per hour, uh, the chance of death and serious injury uh, uh, when an impact occurs increases dramatically. Uh, so below 30 kilometers per hour, the chance of death and injury for striking a pedestrian is, is, uh, is reasonably low. Above that figure, it becomes quite high. And we have similar figures for uh, side impact uh, that typically occur at, at intersections, uh, and that speed is around 50 kilometers per hour. Uh, below that speed, we can survive that side impact um, reasonably well. Above that, the chance of death and serious injury increases dramatically. Uh, and similarly, for head-on crashes, the figure is about 70 kilometers per hour for each vehicle. Uh, in modern vehicles with uh, all the, the airbags and crumple zones, etc., the chance of survival is, is quite reasonable, up to about 70 k per hour. But above that, the chances decrease dramatically. And this is our, our new understanding from the safe system approach. Uh, and there's certainly a very strong link between road function, speed, and infrastructure provision. Uh, so um, for us to eliminate death and serious injury, for instance, where there are pedestrians, uh, we'd need to have speeds around 30k per hour. But that's obviously not desirable in all cases. And on, on many of our roads, we want to have higher speeds than that. Uh, and so the interplay between speed and provision of appropriate infrastructure is, is critical. Uh, for those locations, we want higher speeds. We need to put in place safe infrastructure for those pedestrians. Uh, and obviously things like footpaths and, and crossing points uh, that, are, that are managed effectively. So just to kind of uh, reiterate that point, uh, this example here is, uh, is a freeway environment uh, and we don't allow pedestrians or, or cyclists on our, our freeways. Uh, we are actually aiming for quite high speeds. We want to in, uh, improve mobility uh, to help us with productivity uh, and efficiencies. Uh, but uh, if we want, want to go faster than 70k per hour, we need to put in place uh, median barrier provision as our ultimate objective. Um, and if we can't do that, then uh, if we want to eliminate death and serious injury uh, until cars improve, then the, the appropriate speed is up to around 70k per hour. So that's where we're heading. This is the aspirational uh, speed uh, that we're heading towards. Uh, but a key point, recognising that often we need speeds that are higher than those values. Uh, and if that's the case, we need to put in place the appropriate infrastructure. 
We've done a lot of work uh, on how this might impact on the setting of speed limits and provision of infrastructure in Australia. Uh, we've had 10 years to be looking at this and we're, we're finally coming through with some, uh, some useful uh, guidance on this issue. Uh, this graphic here comes from a project we completed uh, several years ago now, uh, myself and a colleague, uh, for Ostroads, and I'll, I'll give you the website uh, at the end of this presentation. But this shows us how to uh, look at reconciling uh, that knowledge around those um, critical speeds and the current speed limit regimes. And this simple graphic really shows the, the broad process, and, and that is we need to understand firstly the mobility speeds, the, the public expectations, uh, and our current speeds uh, on our arterials and intersections, for instance, might be 70k per hour. Uh, we might then look at what the uh, critical speeds based on those uh, impact speeds and the human uh, tolerances to, to impact forces might be. Uh, and in this case, we know that intersection speed should be 50 kilometres per hour. And so um, on one hand, we know what the public perhaps expect. Uh, on the other, we know what is required to give us a safe outcome. And then there's a gap analysis between those two figures. Uh, and so at that stage, we need to either put in place infrastructure to allow that higher speed, um, or we need to put in place uh, speed limits and speed management to, to, to reduce the speeds. But often what we're left with is the need to change driver perceptions. Uh, and this is a key point that um, we need to make very clear the function of roads uh, and to put in place uh, infrastructure to match the function of the road uh, with the driver expectations. Uh, and you may have heard the term self-explaining roads as uh, the solution uh, from some of the European countries to this. Uh, and, and look, very simply, there are some quite easy things we can do to, uh, to manage the perceptions uh, of the, the type of road we're on. Uh, really, the first step, though, is to categorise our roads uh, based on uh, the hierarchy and what the function of that road might be. In terms of very simple solutions, it can be done just purely with uh, paint and, and line markings. Uh, here's a typical urban arterial road. Uh, it's actually a, a collector road in, in, in Melbourne. Um, in this case, uh, speeds were quite high, uh, but you can see in this uh, bit of network, it's quite a wide road, uh, a bit of a racetrack in terms of the look and feel. Uh, and so some of the cheap options we have, and I'll, I'll come on to some more solutions in a moment, um, uh, allow us to actually change the, the visual impression of this road uh, and to uh, you know, allow the, the road user to better understand what's expected. Uh, and so in this case, we can put in a few uh, islands, whether they're built or, or, or painted, uh, they're, they're quite cheap. And that just really reinforces the, the slower function of this road. One of the important things we need to do uh, in any country, Canada, Australia, uh, anywhere in the world, is to set speed limits to better uh, give guidance to road users. Uh, and so we've been adjusting our uh, policies around the uh, setting of speed limits. Uh, and uh, one of the things we're very aware of is the inconsistencies in speed limits in different locations, whether that be in different regions in the country uh, or even within one city. Uh, and it's often the case that uh, different engineers perhaps do an assessment uh, alongside the police, maybe, uh, and they make them up with different results in terms of what recommendations they, they come up with. And so what we've done is we've developed decision trees and software to actually guide us through that process uh, and to provide recommendations based on our policies of what the speed limit should be. And so uh, any two engineers will then uh, produce the same uh, outcome. And that then leads to quite consistent uh, speed limits um, across uh, cities, uh, areas in, in the whole country. So we've developed software in Australia to do this, and uh, it's also been picked up in, in the US, and this uh, slide here comes from, from the US, from their software tool that we uh, helped develop called, called US Limits. Uh, and this is a very um, trans, a transparent approach. People can see the thought process that's led to the, the speed limit. Uh, it's evidence-based and it's defendable. Uh, and so it's a very useful tool for us to demonstrate to the public why decisions have been made, as well as leading to this consistent uh, setting of speed limits. I want to turn my attention now to some of the uh, solutions that we use uh, in Australia, and many of these will be very familiar to you, um, perhaps one or two are, are new. Uh, and so a lot of the ideas we're getting now for our urban arterial roads and our rural network even are based on the experience we've had on our local road networks. And for many years we've put in place uh, treatments, uh, infrastructure treatments particularly, uh, that lead to uh, a, a, a lower speed environment. And again, it's matching this perception of the road user to the function of the road. And so some of the th things we've been doing on local roads are shown in, in some of these images here. Uh, things like lane narrowing, uh, introducing slow points, 
Uh, we use uh, roundabouts um, extensively for our local networks at intersections. We introduce um, uh, traffic humps and raised intersections as well. Uh, and stuff led to um, uh, better speeds on our local road networks. Aiming potentially longer term towards that 30k environment um, and right now in Australia we're probably more closer to a 40k environment for our local roads. Um, if there's adequate infrastructure that's okay but perhaps over time we're, we're moving closer to uh, more of a, a 30k environment and, and that's really got to be supported through infrastructure uh, and letting the public know what's expected. So we've taken a lot of these concepts and applied them to higher order uh, networks and one that will be very familiar with you um, in this regard is the, the use of, of roundabouts uh, and these are applied very widely on our uh, urban uh, arterials but also our rural networks um, and it's uh, one of the most effective treatment types that we, we apply at intersections. Around about a 70% reduction in, in crashes, uh, and even higher for, for the fatal and, and serious outcomes. Um, and they do operate by reducing speeds on approach and through the roundabout. So it really is a speed uh, uh, feature, as well as changing the, uh, the angle of impacts when, when crashes do occur. And we find that installing roundabouts uh, on our urban networks, we do get a, a good reduction in speeds, up to around 10k per hour. But for our rural networks, um, we, we, we find a larger reduction. So perhaps in a 100k environment, we introduce a roundabout with a design speed of uh, anything as low as 40k per hour. Uh, and vehicles slow on approach and through the uh, roundabout. Uh, and that means that if a crash does occur at those sorts of speeds, it will be survivable. So if you think back to those uh, critical speeds we mentioned earlier for intersections, a critical speed of 50k per hour, we're trying to introduce designs of less than that to, um, to allow survivability for when crashes uh, do occur. Some of the more recent approaches though, we're moving to the use of uh, raised intersections, uh, either the intersection itself or in this example here on approach. Uh, this was a 70k environment uh, and we've introduced a platform on approach that's got a design of 50k per hour. Uh, and so vehicles expected to slow to that sort of a speed. Um, and we're finding um, some good reduction from this approach, around about uh, eight kilometres per hour uh, in this environment, and quite a substantial reduction in crashes from the, the, uh, the reviews we've undertaken. Uh, and again, this critical speed of 50k per hour is what we're aiming for here. This is actually a, a, an arterial road, quite a high volume arterial, uh, and quite a major intersection. So we're getting quite good uh, acceptance from the public in terms of its, uh, its use, uh, and that's mainly because we've put in place um, education programs around the use of this infrastructure. Uh, away from intersections, again on urban arterials, we're putting in place uh, raised platforms and also raised uh, crossing points, uh, raised pedestrian crossings. Um, and these are designed to around about a 30k design speed so that, again, if a, a collision occurs with a pedestrian, uh, it'll certainly result in some, uh, some injury, but it won't result in, in death and serious injury, uh, or certainly a lesser chance of that. Uh, and so, again, quite large reductions in speeds, up to about 25 uh, kilometres per hour from this uh, treatment and quite substantial reductions in, in death and, and serious injury as well, so around the 40% mark for that. So these have just been introduced um, now on the urban arterials, they've been on collector roads for many years uh, and so we're, we're closely monitoring the public response and the, the safety outcomes from this sort of a treatment. Another bit of work we've been doing is uh, for our rural road network and one of our particular problem locations is in, in small towns, uh, driving from a high speed environment, a rural road into a, a township. Uh, and this has been used for many years in, in the UK, uh, more recently in New Zealand and now more so in Australia. Uh, and we find that introducing uh, these sorts of gateway treatments uh, shows a better demarcation between the high speed environment and the low speed township. Uh, and particularly if we introduce a pinch point or a point of road narrowing, and that can be done visually, as in uh, many of these examples here, uh, just through the use of paint, um, and creates the impression that we're going into a different environment. And we get quite major reductions in speeds in the order of 25 kilometres per hour. Uh, and we found that if we use pinch points, the reduction in fatal and serious injury through these townships is around 40%. And that gives us very, very high uh, benefits um, for the low cost investment here. This is just a bit of paint and some additional signs uh, by and large. So a very effective treatment um, that, we, that we use. It can also be used in a more urban environment, perhaps um, linking or separating uh, higher speed uh, urban arterials to, to the lower speed network uh, on approach to schools or uh, in areas where there's public transport interchanges uh, as examples. 
The next one we've borrowed from uh, North America, and in the US they call this uh, a road diet or a, a two-way uh, left turn lane. Uh, and this is um, showing that uh, previously there was uh, four lanes, two lanes in each direction. And that's been converted to a situation when there's just one lane in each direction, plus a central turning lane where vehicles can, can turn into side roads. Um, and this is often coupled with a lowering of the speed limit. Uh, it's now a more constricted road environment. Uh, and so we can actually um, get better compliance with lower speed uh, limits when this is put in place. And from our evaluations here in Australia, we're seeing about a 5k per hour reduction in speeds and about a 35% km, uh, 35 reduction in casualties from the use of this sort of, sort of treatment. Uh, again, it may be one that you're already using um, in, in, in Canada. And similarly, there's other ways to, to narrow roads. Uh, in this case, we can use uh, either uh, painted medians or, or uh, constructed medians. And again, just to change the perception of the road, to narrow it down, <clears throat> we might couple that with a, a lower speed limit uh, to, um, to really enforce what the function of this road is. And this is used particularly in areas like uh, shopping strips uh, and, and centres. The last infrastructure example I've got here is uh, from a rural environment. Uh, and this is quite a recent initiative and I think uh, very applicable to both Australia and Canada. Um, like you, we've got vast expense, expanse of network where uh, quite low volumes and we can't afford to put in place um, high quality infrastructure uh, right across that network. So what we're doing in this sort of location is putting in place um, a wide centre line treatment. Uh, there's an audio tactile uh, centre line here as well. And that's coupled with the, the lower speed limit of, uh, in this case, 90 kilometres per hour. And we're getting very, very good compliance to that lower speed limit. Uh, if we just put in that lower speed limit um, without any uh, other change, we would have expected lower compliance. But I think what we're seeing here is, again, matching the perception uh, of the driver to the, the speed environment. And uh, certainly they can better understand that this is a risk location and that um, there is a need to perhaps travel differently and more cautiously on this network. Uh, and so we are seeing good reductions in speeds, up to about 10k per hour from this treatment. But we're seeing very substantial reductions in death and serious injury as well. So both from that lower speed, but also from that wider separation between oncoming vehicles. Uh, and so up to around about 40%, 45% reduction in fatal and serious injuries from, from this, again, low cost treatment. So I focused uh, so far on the infrastructure uh, approaches we use in terms of speed management. Um, that's certainly my background and where I spend most of my time. But I just very quickly just wanted to um, reinforce that we don't just use uh, uh, infrastructure improvements that's coupled with changes to speed limits, but also enforcement and education programs. Uh, and we're moving to a situation now where we're using more um, uh, speed and red light cameras at intersections. And we're also starting to see uh, increased use of point-to-point um, -point camera systems. Uh, and these are uh, systems whereby we have one camera at the start of a, a road section, and that section might be 10, 20, 30 kilometres or even longer. Uh, and so particularly fitting for uh, lower volume rural networks. Uh, so uh, basically the camera system uh, recognises the time at which a vehicle enters, uh, and then leaves that segment, and so therefore it can calculate the uh, the average speed over that section and whether a person's been speeding. Uh, and it's actually very effective, um, quite high reductions in, in crashes and uh, good compliance of speeds, but it's also seen as fairer by the motoring public in that they weren't just momentarily speeding uh, at an intersection or a point, but it was over a, a sustained period. And so I think people can recognise more that this is a fairer system, and we do get quite good feedback in terms of the, the public response uh, to this. So certainly uh, enforcement and education campaigns, which um, I guess are done in, in most countries uh, through television and, and other marketing sources. Uh, and there's some very good uh, videos around um, the importance of speed uh, and the issues around speed and, and crash risk. Just with a, a look to the future, uh, and this is a, an area that we're working in uh, more and more now, is the in-vehicle uh, solutions. Uh, and certainly um, the, the top image there and the one to the left show uh, the uh, speed limit warning type approaches, uh, intelligent speed assist type systems. And they can be advisory, they can tell us what uh, the recommended speed is, or uh, in a more uh, intrusive way, they can actually uh, control the, ve the vehicle speeds. And uh, these are actually used now in, in, uh, in Australia. If a speeder has been caught on several occasions speeding, then they may be required to actually fit uh, a mandatory system to their vehicle that will ensure they don't speed into the future. 
And this can be used as part of a more comprehensive uh, uh, training and education program uh, as to re the reasons why they shouldn't be speeding, uh, the impacts on uh, on risk and, and, and the general public. Uh, and so a good way to, to, to bring together technology and, and, uh, and education. The image on the bottom right here really represents uh, the newer vehicle systems. Uh, we're seeing more and more uh, in our vehicle fleets. And that's systems that can recognise what's happening uh, in the traffic ahead. It can match the, the speed of the vehicle in front or even brake if, uh, if that's necessary. So I think um, in terms of this pillar approach, the vehicle pillar will certainly play a stronger role into the future. Uh, and we do, again, just uh, coming back to the safe system, need to recognise that achieving uh, safe system outcomes will require all these different pillars working together. Uh, lastly, just the source of information, uh, further uh, guidance around this, this speed management topic. Uh, we were involved here in the production of the Global Guide to Speed Management, the document on the left, uh, and that's produced by the World Health Organization, uh, and the website's there and available uh, for you to download for free. Um, that's really basic information aimed mainly at those working in, in low and middle income countries, but I think there's still some good information there for, uh, for those working in, in the likes of Canada or, or Australia. The three documents on the right hand side are all uh, Austroads guides and, and Austroads is our national roads agency uh, here in Australia. Uh, we do a lot of work for them and we've uh, produced these three documents here. Uh, just in the last couple of weeks we've uh, updated our, our guide on local area traffic management, so speed devices for the local road network. Uh, the middle one there is one that I published uh, um, just earlier this year on achieving speeds on urban arterial roads. There's around 30 solutions or options uh, in that document, some of which I've touched on today, which we can use uh, to better manage speeds on, on urban arterial roads. Uh, and the one on the far right is a document similar. This is solutions for the rural network. Uh, and again, uh, these documents are accessible from the Austroads website. Uh, you need to initially log in uh, and, and download those. Uh, but also our own website, the ARB, dot com dot au website uh, has all of our publications uh, and also uh, webinars and other training materials that we, we provide uh, both in terms of uh, road safety speed management included but also other elements uh, of, of road management so in summary uh, just to uh, to reaffirm we do know and it's very clear that there's a very strong link between uh, speed and death and serious injury and certainly speed is a major cause uh, and small reductions in speed can bring about very substantial uh, safety benefits. We do know more about these survivable speeds, 30, 50, 70 I mentioned, uh, and that's really uh, come through from the safe system approach we're taking, and that gives us our direction in terms of where we want to be, uh, in terms of uh, provision of safe speeds, but also recognising that where we want higher speeds, and that's in many situations we want higher speeds than that, we need to put in place the appropriate infrastructure, infrastructure to provide the right protection. We do know the solutions, we have the, the tools available, the speed limit setting tool I mentioned, that, uh, that US limits type approach. Um, so there's certainly guidance around the uh, policies and procedures for setting speed limits. I've spoken today mainly about the engineering measures that we can use, uh, particularly using uh, deflection and uh, things like road narrowing. Um, and there's uh, good guidance around the effectiveness of these different treatments. Uh, but also drawing on these other pillars, um, the enforcement, uh, education side of things, and, and also I mentioned there, uh, the vehicle technologies as well. And lastly, the guidance is available, um, um, certainly uh, from those websites I've shown you. Uh, but I'll, I'll be also happy to um, take any uh, queries via email. Uh, and hopefully if the technology works, um, I'll be available in the next few minutes now to answer any questions uh, or provide any uh, clarification on the, on the points that I've made. Uh, but at this stage, I'd like to thank you for your, uh, your attention, and I hope there's been something of interest there for you, uh, and I hope that um, we can have a good discussion on this very important issue. Thank you.